I'd like to talk today about the journey of the uh, sons of Jacob to Egypt, where they're going to encounter Joseph, but really not recognize him. We find this in chapter 20, uh, 42 of the book of Genesis. It starts out with Jacob learning that there is grain available in Egypt, and there's a widespread famine in the area, so he's like pondering this, and he's saying, you know, it would be good if we went there and if we got some of this grain. Uh, so he tells his sons, and, and he has a wonderful expression, he says, uh, stop really gaping at one another <laughs> and, you know, get off your rear ends and, and go to Egypt and get us some grain. Uh, if you don't get us some grain, maybe we're going to starve to death. Uh, so what happens is 10 of the brothers now go to Egypt. Uh, Benjamin does not go. And the reason he doesn't go, of course, is because of the <coughs> special relationship that Jacob has with Benjamin. He's the youngest child, uh, the second child of his beloved Rachel uh, that they conceived. And of course, the first child, Joseph, at this point, Jacob presumes he's dead. So Benjamin, special affection that he has for Benjamin. Uh, Joseph is the one who is in charge of distributing the food. That was the position that he had. So people would come to him and they would request food and he would see to the distribution of the food. Now, would somebody who was in Joseph's position in Egypt do that? Uh, there's some speculation by some scholars who say, well, you know, maybe not, maybe he did. Uh, but in any case, the biblical narrative has Joseph in charge and the brothers uh, coming to him. Now, Joseph immediately recognizes the 10 brothers. But they do not recognize him. Maybe he had a beard, maybe a change of appearance. Uh, it's been a number of years. Could be a number of reasons why they don't recognize him, but. Uh, and of course, they're not thinking he's alive. So, uh, you know, that's, you know, he was sold into slavery. Uh, he's gone. He's, you know, they're not thinking about him. So that's uh, another factor. So Joseph, when he recognizes them, speaks sternly to them. So he takes that attitude of, you know, I'm in charge here. And he, he speaks rather harshly to them. Uh, and Joseph was uh, reminded of the dreams that he had about them where they were supposed to bow down to him. And of course, now this is what's happening. Those dreams that he had earlier are coming true, just like the dreams that the Pharaoh had are coming true, that the baker had, the royal baker, the, the cupbearer, all of these dreams have been coming true. Uh, so Joseph accused them of being spies which would not have been out of the ordinary. There were, you know, spies who would come and the particular route that the brothers were taking uh, to get to Egypt was one that was noted for all sorts of violence and uh, the possibility of spies and people coming to infiltrate the kingdom. So that, that was not something that was really out of the ordinary. They denied it, though. They said, oh, we're not spies. We're just here to get food. Joseph said that, okay, you're here to get food, but you're going to have to stay here in Egypt and you have to be under arrest until that younger brother would come. <laughs> he knows that, you know, Benjamin isn't here. He wants the younger brother to come. So he, he lays out this condition. So Joseph locked them up in the guardhouse for three days. So they are arrested for three days. And after three days, Joseph kind of changes his mind. He has a little, you know, second thoughts about this. And notice, of course, the, the symbolism, the three days, that typical period that we see, that period of waiting and change that, that we see in the Bible, the three-day period. Uh, so Joseph says, well, I'm going to change my mind here a little bit. Only one brother now has to stay, not all of you, uh, but just the one brother. Uh, and the others could take some food back, 
uh, to Canaan with them. So you can go back, I'll give you some food, but one brother has to set, has to uh, stay. Uh, and part of it is that they must come back, they want that other brother released, they must come back with the younger brother. So again, Joseph is thinking, how can I get that younger brother to come here? So the ten, ten, ten brothers talk about it among themselves, and they agree to this uh, condition, which of course is much easier for them than the original proposition. So you can see why they would agree with that. And as they were talking among themselves, they were thinking that this happened as a punishment to us for what we did to Joseph. We treated him miserably. Uh, we did a bad thing. We sold him off. So God, in a way, is visiting this upon us as our punishment. And Reuben speaks to them and says, Reuben, who is the oldest, says that they didn't listen to him when he told them not to harm Joseph. He says, in his own words, now comes the reckoning for his blood. So they are presuming he's dead, and now the justice part, the reckoning, is what is happening to them. Joseph, however, understands what they're saying. They think that they're speaking in another language, that Joseph won't understand this, and but Joseph understands everything they're saying, and he turns away from them. He's overcome with emotion, and he weeps. Doesn't show them that he's weeping, but but he was overcome when he heard them talking among themselves about what they did to him and what Reuben had shared. So when he was able to speak again, Joseph said, uh, we'll take uh, Simeon, who's the next oldest, we won't take Reuben. And part of the reason probably not taking Reuben is Reuben's role in trying to intervene to save Joseph. So they take the second oldest brother, which a little bit unusual, normally would be the oldest brother, right? Uh, and they had him bound right in front of the other brothers. And Joseph gave orders to his servants uh, and his uh, people who worked under him, his soldiers, and all of those who were facilitating the distribution. He said, uh, in the containers of these nine, uh, fill them with grain, uh, but also replace the money uh, in each one's sack and give them provisions for their journey. So it shows, again, his generosity. Not only was he giving them grain, he was giving them their money back, which they were, of course, presuming would be the cost for the grain, the, giving them the money. And also being very considerate, they wouldn't have to, you know, think about where they're going to stop for food or anything. He gave them provisions so that they would be okay on their journey home. Very, very generous of Joseph. So the nine brothers load their donkeys, put all the sacks on the donkeys, and they don't look into the sacks at this point, but they just load the donkeys. And during the night, one of the brothers decides, well, I'll open my bag and see what's in there. And in his bag, he was surprised to see the money in the mouth of his bag. And the brothers were upset at this. And they wondered what God had done because <coughs> they're thinking, well, this money, it, it's there, it's, you know, in their sacks, and maybe... They'll think we stole the money, or we took it, or we didn't give it to them, or, you know, there was some foul play, and, and, and this will be difficult for us. So when they get back to Canaan, they tell uh, Jacob what had happened, and what has to be done to get Simeon back. But Jacob gets very upset. He gets upset because Benjamin would have to go to Egypt. He says, why do these things always happen to me? Jacob, it was always running into all sorts of problems. We had the birthright with Esau, we had the problems with Laban, and now this situation, you know, the problem with Joseph, and now Benjamin. He's thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to lose Benjamin too. This is terrible. So Reuben says, don't worry, Dad. Don't worry. We've got this covered. He said, I will make sure that Benjamin will come back home. I promise no problem. 
Don't worry about it. We will make sure that Benjamin comes back. And he said, if Benjamin doesn't come back, you can kill my two sons if I don't return with him. That's how seriously he was pledging. Jacob, however, refused. He thought Joseph was dead, and he did not want to lose Benjamin as well. Naturally, you can understand his situation. And he says something really profound here. He says, if something would happen to Benjamin, he says, it would send my whole head down to the netherworld in grief. I would be so upset. I couldn't bear the grief. I would go down to the netherworld with grief. Expression that really just means, uh, you know, how could I handle it? I already lost my one son, whom I loved with Rachel, and now the youngest one also, it would be terrible. Now, what can we learn from this story in chapter 42 and this journey that the brothers make to Joseph and their return and the situation with Jacob? Well, first of all, we see Jacob's deep love for Benjamin. We see the connection with Rachel. We see this love that we saw initially between Jacob and Rachel, that love still very strong, just a beautiful bond of love. And so uh, it's expressed in his deep affection for Benjamin. We also see that Joseph does not tell his brothers who he is. And we ask ourselves, why? Why wasn't he more upfront? Why wasn't he more honest? Why didn't he say, you know, I'm your brother and I'm here and it's great to see you. Well, part of his reasoning might be <clears throat> that he wanted to see Benjamin. He wanted to see his dad, Jacob. He was hoping to work out some way of them coming also to Egypt so he could encounter them again. Uh, and also maybe a little testing of the brothers uh, could have been in store here. So a couple of reasons why he doesn't reveal his identity uh, right away. Also a very interesting discovery Joseph makes. Joseph discovers now for the first time the role that Reuben played in trying to save him. And that really means a lot to him. And so Joseph reacts really in terms of his humanity, his emotions, his weeping. We see the human side of Joseph and his love for all his brothers, his love for his family, uh, and yet this whole conflict that emerged in the family. And also he sees the love that Reuben had for him to intervene in that way. And so Simeon stays, the second oldest, not Reuben, as a result of that. And we see also Joseph's generosity. What a generous person he is in giving so much to his brother. So another aspect. We see Joseph as certainly very intelligent. We see him as a good planner, his ability to interpret dreams, uh, his skills recognized in terms of uh, all of his many abilities, the promotions he got in terms of Potiphar uh, and giving him so much respect, his promotions in the jail, his relationship with Pharaoh, and now his generosity, his really love for family, and his deep generosity. We see also that poor Reuben again makes a plan that is not agreed to. He made the plan with the brothers, the brothers veto that. He makes a plan with his father, Jacob, about, you know, I'll take care of Benjamin. Uh, if I don't bring him back, you can kill my two sons. Again, rejected. So Reuben makes the plans, but nobody goes for them. And finally, we see Jacob's refusal to go. And we can understand it. It's a product of his deep love for Benjamin. So we see this beautiful family story, many levels unfolding before us in chapter 42. And what does it remind us of? Of course, it reminds us of the importance of saying yes to God. And who was the very first one in the Bible who said yes to God? It was, of course, Father Abraham. Father Abraham has many friends, many friends has Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so were you. So let's all praise the Lord. Keep on praising the Lord.